Now, Revelation chapter 21, the Bible reads in verse 1, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. Now, just to back up a little bit into chapter 20, we saw when the heaven and the earth passed away in verse 11 of chapter 20. The Bible reads, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And so we see here the great white throne judgment is where heaven and earth flee away. And basically every single person who's ever lived is going to be at that judgment because there's no other place to be. Heaven and earth are gone. Everyone is at that great white throne. Now, it's only the dead that are being judged. Those of us that are saved, we will have already been resurrected more than a thousand years before this. Long before this, we've already been resurrected. So we're not being judged by our works at this event, but the dead are being judged. The unsaved who are, are brought up at this time to stand before the great white throne. Now go to 2 Peter chapter 3, because in 2 Peter chapter 3, we have another scripture that deals with the subject of the earth and the heaven passing away. In chapter 20 of Revelation, it said that the earth and the heaven fled away. Jesus Christ said in Matthew 24, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. So this world's not going to be here forever. And people are intent upon preserving it, and they think, you know, well, we're going to have to be here for millions of years. We need to make this thing last. Well, it's not going to be here for that long. What the Bible calls the New Testament is the last days. And we know that this earth so far has been around for about 6,246 years, you know, give or take, you know, 20 years. But we know that this world is going to pass away. Everything in it's going to be gone, and there's going to be a completely new heaven and new earth. I'm going to show you some of the differences between the new heaven and earth and the old heaven and earth, because they are not the same. Look down, if you would, at 2 Peter chapter 3. It says in verse 10, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be? in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. So the Bible tells us that because we know that everything on this earth is going to be dissolved and that there's eventually going to be a new heaven and a new earth, that should affect the way that we live our life. I mean, what manner of persons ought we to be if we know that everything around us is going to be burned up, the car is going to be burned up, the house is going to be burned up, the boat's going to be burned up? We're definitely not going to be covetous people who live our lives for how many possessions we can amass and how much money we can make and how many physical things we can acquire. They're all going to be burned up. And that's why the Bible says, set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. If we're realizing that the new heavens and the new earth will take the place of this earth, we're going to focus on things that are eternal. Things like the people in our life, our families, people that we can win to the Lord, people that come to our church. We're going to think about things that are eternal, not the temporal things. But if you would flip back to Revelation 21, and we'll see what the Bible says about the new heaven and the new earth. It makes it very clear right away that the new heaven... And the new earth are dramatically different because in the first verse there, when it says that the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, it says, and there was no more sea. And of course, the earth as it stands right now is covered in the sea. In fact, there's more sea than there is dry land. But on the new earth, there is no more sea. It's all dry land. Another colossal difference between the old earth and the new earth is that the old earth had hell at its core or hell at its center. The Bible teaches today that hell is in the center of the earth, in the heart of the earth, in the nether parts of the earth. Whereas Jesus talked about people being cast in the lake of fire as being cast into outer darkness. Obviously, there's nothing outer about being in the center of the earth. So at this time, hell is located in the center of the earth. But in chapter 20, we saw that hell was moved. It was relocated to the lake of fire in outer darkness. And so the new earth will not contain hell will be another difference. Let's keep reading. It says in verse 2, And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, 
coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And we're going to get back to the new Jerusalem and the bride there. But look at verse 3. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. So in the new earth, there's going to be no sorrow, no sadness, no crying, no death. And really, when we go to heaven at the rapture, these things still might come into play in our lives. Because there could be sorrow, for example, at the great white throne. When we see lost loved ones, perhaps, being cast in the lake of fire, there could be crying and tears. And so here, after the millennium, at the time of the new heaven and the new earth, God talks about wiping away the tears from our eyes and that there will be never again any sorrow, any death, any pain. And so this is the ultimate goal right here, the new heaven and the new earth. It says in verse 7, He that overcometh shall inherit all things. And I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Now, what does he mean there when he says in verse 7, he that overcometh? Let me just quickly go through this. Go to 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter number 5. The term overcometh is, is not really a term that's used very much in the Bible. But it's used a lot at the very end of the Bible. It's used in 1 John. It's used a lot in the book of Revelation. Look what the Bible says about it in, in 1 John chapter 5, verse number 4. It says, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. So the Bible's very clear here, and if you understand the grammar there of verse 5, what he's saying is that the only people who overcome the world are those who believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, if you understand that grammar. The Bible's really clear that overcoming means that you're born again, that you have faith, that you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And by the way, that's how you get saved is by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, not through your own good works or your own goodness. Now, why is that called overcoming the world? I'll tell you why. Because the world is out to stop you from doing just that. And that's why the Bible calls this overcoming the world. When you believe on Jesus Christ, that tells me that the world's school system is not trying to get you to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. In fact, they are actively trying to stop you from believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. The world's entertainment, Hollywood, TV, movies, the school system, the governments of the world, the advertising, all of the world and what it has to offer is geared toward hindering you from believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And in order to get saved, you have to overcome that. You have to hear the Word of God and believe it in spite of what the world's telling you. You know, you go to the school system, they'll tell you that everything came from nothing. You know, there was nothing, and then it exploded, and then, and then there was some stuff, and then it, you know, it turned into other stuff, and then eventually it came to life. We don't really understand how, but we're going to give it a fancy name. We're going to call it a biogenesis, and then it sounds a little more official. And, and, you know, it evolved and all this just lies, just garbage. And, and then they teach it in the science department when it, it should be in the, you know, the, the fairy tale department. Yeah. And, and all these lies out there. And then TV will show you all these biblical movies and Jesus movies that pervert the gospel and change things. All of it is geared towards stopping you from really believing the truth and believing the gospel. And that's why the Bible calls the person who is saved someone who overcomes the world. And when we go to Revelation 2, flip over to Revelation 2, that's still what it means when it talks about the one who has overcome. And if you look up the different times that he mentions it in chapters 2 and 3, you'll see that it is consistent with referring to salvation through believing on Jesus Christ, through faith. There was no mention of works when we talked about overcoming. And in Revelation chapter 2, you'll see that as we look at these different he that overcometh. Let's look at the first one in verse 7. It says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Well, if you remember back in Genesis, the tree of life was associated with living forever. 
Because when they were kicked out of the garden, uh, they were kicked out because they were told, you know, you can't eat, man can't eat of the tree of life or he will live forever if he eats of the tree of life. So again, here it's being associated with eternal life, being born again, being saved. Okay, jump down if you would to verse 11. Halfway through it says, he that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. Still consistent. It says in verse 17, partway through, To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth. It's showing that those of us who are saved will receive a new name at some point when we get to heaven, that no man knoweth except us. And then, of course, it says in verse 26, And he that overcometh, and... So did this person just overcome and do nothing else? No, the Bible says, he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end. So here's somebody who not only believed on Christ, but they also did the works. He says, to him will I give power over the nations. So you see, doing good works gets you rewards. It'll give you a greater authority in the kingdom of God. You'll be rewarded. Jesus said, behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. But when it comes to just being saved, it's just faith alone. If you also keep his works unto the end, you get additional power. You get additional rewards and so forth. Look at chapter 3, verse 5. It says, He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. But I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Let me ask you this. Is God going to blot out of the book of life the name of anyone who has believed on Christ? No, because he promised, look, him that overcometh is not going to be blotted out of the book of life. His name will be confessed before the Father. Look at verse 12. It says, Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. We'll see that in Revelation 22 when it says, They shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. Verse 21, it says, To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. So let's flip back over to Revelation 21 with that in mind. It says in verse 7, He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the fearful and the an unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. There's not a lot of middle ground with God, is there? I mean, you either overcome and inherit all things and God's your father and you're his son or you're going to the lake of fire. I mean, the only two choices are heaven or hell. And when the Bible gives this list of sins, a lot of people will take that list and say, well, if you commit those sins, you're not, that's proof that you're not saved. I've heard people say that. But that's not really accurate at all. I bet you that every single person has told a lie. And the Bible includes they're all liars. There's another list that's similar over in Galatians 5. You know, mentions thieves, drunkards, other types of sins. But, but I'll, and people will say, see, if, if somebody's a drunk, they're not saved. Look, Noah got drunk. David committed murder, okay? People that are saved can definitely commit these sins. But when the Bible says in Galatians 5 that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God, you also have to keep in mind that the Bible says that flesh and blood shall not inherit the kingdom of God. You know, we in our sinful condition often walk in the flesh and fulfill the works of the flesh. And that's what it says when it gives that list in Galatians 5. It says, now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. And then he goes in, you know, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. And he goes through all those sins saying, these are the works of the flesh. Look, as long as we're living in the flesh, we have a tendency to want to walk in the flesh and then we're going to commit sins of the flesh. But thank God at the resurrection or commonly known as the rapture, you know, we're going to be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye and our sinful flesh will be gone. We're not going to inherit the kingdom of God in this sinful flesh. When we get to heaven, we'll never sin again. Someone who believes on the Lord Jesus Christ may be a drunkard upon this earth, but they will not inherit the kingdom of God as a drunkard because, of course, they will be changed in a moment in a twinkling of an eye. The sinful flesh will be gone forever and they will enter as a spiritual person, body, soul, and spirit. But it says here, all liars, and you know, this is a great scripture when you're trying to get somebody to understand that the penalty of sin is hell. You know, the wages of sin is death. 
Because a lot of people think, well, to go to hell, you have to be really bad. You have to be a murderer, for example, to go to hell. But then he also says all liars. Now, some people will look at this scripture that says all liars and they'll say, well, that's talking about somebody who lies habitually. Have you ever heard that one? You know, that's somebody who just lies all the time. Somebody who just tells, you know, a lie every once in a while, like myself, you know, they're not really a liar. But the evidence is found in the last verse of this chapter. In verse 27, talking about the heavenly Jerusalem, it says, There shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination, or maketh a lie. But they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. Look, one lie is equivalent to being a liar in this chapter. One lie will keep you out of that heavenly city. I know I've told a lie. I'm sure you have to. None of us deserves to go there, but we will go there by grace through faith. Amen. And that's the gift of God right there. So look, look down, if you would, at verse 9 of chapter 21. It says, And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. Now this is the main subject of this chapter. The vast majority of this chapter deals with the subject of the bride of Christ. And the bride of Christ in this chapter is synonymous with the city, the heavenly Jerusalem. Look at the next verse. He said, I'll show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. Verse 10 says this, and he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. Now, you can't get around this, folks. He says, I'm going to show you the bride, and then it says, he showed me the city. Obviously, the city here is equivalent to the bride. I mean, isn't that pretty obvious as we look at this? Now, here's what's interesting. 99% of, of people that you talk to, it seems like, I totally misunderstand the subject of the bride of Christ in the Bible. And there are a couple different variations on this. Let me first talk about the most extreme variation. There's a teaching out there of people who call themselves Baptist briders. And, and it always blows my mind how people just create these man-made doctrines that have no basis in reality. They have no basis in Scripture. And they're, they're vehement. I mean, they're just militantly promoting this doctrine. And there's so many things that the Bible actually says that we could get all fired up about. They get fired up about things that aren't even in the Bible. For example, uh, when Brother Chris Sosi started coming to our church... Some of his family warned him. They said, you know, stay away from that faithful word Baptist church. They said, that's a bad church. And he said, well, what's wrong with it? He said, well, they're a non-brider church. And he said, non-brider? What in the world does that mean? And he came to me and he said, Pastor Anderson, I hear you're a non-brider. What's that mean? And I told him, I said, I'll tell you what, Chris. I said, on Sunday morning, I'm going to preach a whole sermon on the bride of Christ. And that's what I did. I preached the whole sermon and explained the whole thing. But this Baptist bride doctrine teaches that the bride of Christ will only consist of Baptists, people that are part of a Baptist church. Now, where in the world they're getting this doctrine, I don't understand. But that's what this, and they're saying I'm a non-brider because I don't believe that strange doctrine that says you're not part of the bride of Christ unless you attend a Baptist church. And then there are even more extreme variations of this that teach that you have to be baptized in a Baptist church by someone who was baptized by someone who was baptized by someone who was baptized by, all the way back to John the Baptist. And if that chain is broken in any way, you're not part of the bride. And you know what? I really hope that, you know, Pastor Armour, who baptized me when I was nine years old, had that pedigree, you know, like, like from the AKC or whatever, going all the way back to John the Baptist, you know, to prove that he was qualified to baptize me. I mean, what kind of a strange doctrine is this? And it's going to become even more obvious to you how bizarre this doctrine is as we actually read what the chapter says. Obviously, that's a strange doctrine. Obviously, that's very bizarre and very extreme to teach that, but there are, there are a lot of people who teach it, believe it or not. But I'll say this, even though that's kind of a fringe teaching and kind of a, an, you know, not as common, I would say this, 99% of Baptists, in my opinion, from what I've seen, 99% of Baptists probably will teach that the bride of Christ consists of church age saints or New Testament saints only. 
will be part of the bride of Christ. And here's what they'll say. The church is the bride of Christ, and therefore the bride of Christ will consist of church-age saints. And I'm sure you've heard it before. I mean, it's probably 99%, literally, that, that teach this. And again, it's very unscriptural. The statement that says the church is the bride of Christ is a false statement. It's not true. Now, first of all, go to chapter 19. I'll prove to you that it's not true. In chapter 19 of Revelation, the Bible reads in verse 7, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. Now, look at verse 7 there. It said... For the marriage of the Lamb is come. The verb is come means it just came right now. And Revelation 19 is at the end of the seven years. So let me ask you this. Is the church the bride of Christ today if the wedding is going to happen in the future after the tribulation and after God has poured out all his wrath? I mean, good night. What if somebody's engaged and they're going to get married a year from now? Would we call that person the bride? Would we call her his wife? No, because she becomes the bride when? On the wedding day. Is she the bride seven years before the wedding day or eight years before the wedding day? Absolutely not. So the statement, the church is the bride of Christ, is a misguided statement, number one. Number two, if you would just use a concordance and just look up the term bride in the Bible, the first time the term bride is used in the New Testament is in John chapter 3. And in John chapter 3, John the Baptist uses a parable to describe himself. And he says, he that hath the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. And what John the Baptist is saying with that parable is that he is not the main event. If you remember, he was always pointing to Jesus Christ, saying, you know, I'm not the Christ. I'm not even worthy to stoop down and unloose his shoe latchet. That's what John the Baptist said. He said, look, he must increase. I must decrease. And what he's using there is a parable to explain, look, Jesus is the bridegroom. I'm more like the best man, because he said, I'm, the, I'm like the friend of the bridegroom. That's where my joy is fulfilled, not to be the main event, but to share in the bridegroom special day. You know, if you're the best man at a wedding, you're not there to steal the show and, and you know, make the day be all about you. No, you're just there to be happy for your friend and to rejoice in his day. And you always want the emphasis at a wedding, of course, to be on the bride and on the groom. And so John the Baptist is just using that parable to explain his role as the best man, so to speak, the guy who points to Jesus and gives him all the glory and lets it be all about him. Now, you can't just take that parable and just run with it and make it mean whatever you want. I mean, that's what it says. That's what he meant. That's the context. End of story. There's a tendency sometimes to abuse parables. And the Bible says the legs of the lame are not equal. So is a parable in the mouth of fools. And so we need to be careful that we don't twist parables into meaning something they don't mean. So the word bride is mentioned in John 3. You want to know when the next time God uses the word bride in the New Testament? Revelation 21. Okay? So there's no mention of the term bride from John 3 to Revelation 21. So it sounds to me like we're going to get our doctrine on the bride of Christ from Revelation 21. Isn't that what it sounds like? Yep. Because that's, where, that's the only place it's mentioned besides John just using a parable about a bride and a bridegroom. Really, Revelation 21 is our primary source of this doctrine. And if we look at Revelation 21 and read it, I can prove to you several different ways right now that the church, quote unquote, is not the bride of Christ. And that the bride of Christ does not consist of church age saints or even New Testament saints, but that rather the bride of Christ consists of every believer who has ever lived throughout all ages. Old Testament, New Testament. And if we let the Bible define itself, we'll see that. Therefore, people saying, you know, well, the church, the bride of Christ is a different group. than you know, No, no, no. The bride of Christ is all believers, all saints from all ages, and I'll prove it to you. Let's read it together. You be the judge. He said, I'm going to show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. 
And her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal, and had a wall great and high, and had twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels, and names written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. Now stop right there. Let me ask you this. Does that sound like a, a New Testament church age group there, the twelve tribes of the children of Israel? Now, if the names are written thereon, that means the names Reuben, Gad, Asher, those are the names that are written on the foundation. Are those people New Testament saints? No, of course not. Let's keep reading. It says, on the east three gates, on the north three gates, on the south three gates, and on the west three gates. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and in them the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. So the gates are labeled with the 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 patriarchs from the Old Testament. The, the foundations are labeled with the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And then it says in verse 15, he that talked with me had a golden reed to measure the city and the gates thereof and the wall thereof. And the city lieth four square and the length is as large as the breadth. And he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs. And we talked about the fact that a furlong is an eighth of a mile. So 12,000 furlongs is 1,500 miles. So this city is huge. It's 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles and 1,500 miles high. This is a huge city. And it says in verse number 16 at the end there, the length and the breadth and the height of it are equal. And he measured the wall thereof, 140 and four cubits, according to the measure of a man, that is of the angel, you know, roughly a little over 200 feet there. And it says in verse 18, the building of the wall of it was of jasper, and the city was pure gold, like unto clear glass. And the foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. We'll come back to the precious stones in a moment. But it says in verse number 21, the 12 gates were 12 pearls. Every several gate was of one pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold, as it were, transparent glass. It says in verse number 22, and I saw no temple therein. For the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon to shine in it. For the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it, and the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, and there shall be no night there, and on and on. So what do we see here? When we look at this passage, is there any mention of the church? or church age saints, or you must go to a Baptist church, or you must be baptized by a guy who was baptized by a guy who was baptized. No, no, no. What we see here is that the people who are part of this city are those that are saved. It says the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it. In Revelation 19, it said that the lamb's wife with clothes and white raiment, which is the righteousness of saints. And look, people in the Old Testament were also called saints. If they were saved, if they were believers, they were called saints. In the New Testament, they're called saints. Look, these are people who are believers from all ages, from all time. I'll prove it to you further. Go, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 2. Because in Ephesians chapter 2, we actually have a tie-in with Revelation 21. Because if you remember, the city has 12 foundations. And on the 12 foundations are written the names of the 12 apostles. You remember that? Well, in Ephesians chapter 2, we see something very similar to that. In verse 20, it says this, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles. Now, you think that's a coincidence? I don't believe anything in the Bible is incidental, coincidental, or accidental. And so if Ephesians 20 is talking about being built on the foundation of the apostles... And then in Revelation 21, he says, look, the city is built on 12 foundations that are named after the 12 apostles. There's a correlation here. Let me show you what that correlation is. Back up to verse 11. It says, wherefore, remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. He's saying, look, you used to be aliens of the commonwealth of Israel. What's an alien? I mean, you know, we, we live in Arizona, so you hear a lot of talk about aliens, right? Illegal aliens. 
Well, think about this. Aliens are foreigners. They're not citizens. If we mention someone being an alien, we're saying they are not a citizen of our nation. Well, here he's saying, look, in time past, look at verse 12. He says, when you were without Christ, you were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. Let me ask this. Once you're in Christ, are you still an alien? No, you're not. Because he says, now in Christ Jesus, verse 13, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both one. And when he says both one, the context shows us he's talking about the uncircumcision and the circumcision both being made one. That he has broken down the middle wall of partition between us. Verse 15, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. And that he might reconcile both unto God. So he's saying, look, the uncircumcision is reconciled to God. The circumcision is reconciled. Both are reconciled to God. They're both made into one. They're both joined together in one. He says that he hath reconciled both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you, which were afar off and to them that were nigh. Look at verse 18. Who are the ones that are far off? The Gentiles. Who are the ones that were nigh? The Jews, okay? And he says here, for through him, we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. That's why the Bible says elsewhere that in Christ there is neither Jew nor Gentile. It says in verse 19, now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners. Remember, he's talking to the Ephesians, they're Gentiles. He's saying, look, you're not uncircumcision. You're not a stranger. You're not a foreigner. You're not an alien. You are a fellow citizen with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Wait a minute now. Who is built on the foundation of the prophets? Just the Gentiles? Just the Ephesians? Just the New Testament? Just the church which is at Ephesus? No, because he made of both one. And he said, all of you are joined together, Jew, Gentile, bond free, circumcision, uncircumcision. You're all built on that foundation of the apostles and prophets. Verse 21, in whom all the what? The building. You know, doesn't that make you think of that city that's built on that foundation? In whom all the building, fitly framed together, groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye are also builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. You say, oh, Pastor Anderson. Ha, ha, ha. This is just saying that in the New Testament, both Jew and Gentile are part of the, you know, the, the bride of Christ and part of that city and part of that building and built on that foundation. But the Old Testament saints of another dispensation, you know, they're not part of it. Okay, go to Hebrews 11. Go to Hebrews 11. Because Hebrews 11 will prove it to you. And really, you should have just been able to just read Revelation 21, see no mention of the church, See, listing Old Testament patriarchs. How many Old Testament patriarchs? Twelve. How many New Testament apostles? Twelve. All in the same building. All in the same city. That city represents the bride of Christ, according to Revelation 21. But look, this is the unequivocal proof right here. In Hebrews 11, talking about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Look what it says in verse 9. By faith he, he is Abraham, by faith he sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with them of the same promise. For he looked for a what? He looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. What city was he looking for? The heavenly Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem. It's obvious, and the Bible proves it further. Let's keep reading. He said in verse 10, he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. But when he got there, he was turned away at the door. Because this is only for the church age, saints. The bride of Christ, you know, it's like the silly rabbit tricks are for kids. You know, silly Abraham, you know, the bride of Christ is only the church. It's not the Old Testament saints. It's not for you. I mean, what kind of nonsense is this doctrine? 
People need to quit listening to Peter Ruckman Amen. and quit listening to all these hyper dispensationalists and all this man-made Clarence Larkin, C.I. Schofield, and they need to get in the Word of God. They need to get a King James Bible and read it and believe it and study it and quit repeating things that have no basis in the Bible. Amen. There is no basis for saying that that city is only going to be for those who are part of the church age. There is no church age. The Bible says glory to God in the church throughout all ages. Amen. Ephesians 3.21. But let's keep reading. It says, He looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Okay, jump down, if you would, to verse 13. These all died in faith not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country and truly if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country that is in heavenly. Wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God for he hath prepared for them a city. Who did he prepare it for? Old Testament saints is who he prepared it for. That's why 12 of their names are on the foundation. Go to chapter 12 of Hebrews. Hebrews talks about this in chapter 11, chapter 12, and chapter 13. Look at chapter 12, verse 22. It says, But ye are come unto the Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. Isn't that the city we're reading about in Revelation 21? It says that you're come to the heavenly Jerusalem and to an innumerable company of angels to the general assembly and church of the firstborn. You say, oh, Pastor Anderson, see right there. It's, just, it's the church. Yeah, church means assembly. We're all going to be assembled. Again, get this church age out of your mind. Moses was with the church in the wilderness. Let me say it again. And it's funny how these people claim to believe the King James Bible is the word of God. And then they don't believe you when you try to show them Acts 7. This is he that was with the church in the wilderness. Oh, that's, you know, a mistranslation. Or, no, no, no. It was the church in the wilderness. Amen. Church means congregation. Look, when we get to heaven, that church, that assembly, that throng, that city, it's going to include Old Testament saints and New Testament saints alike. It says, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. Now look at chapter 13. It says in verse 13, let us go for therefore unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach, for here have we no continuing city, but we seek one to come. So look, in chapter 11, the Old Testament saints were seeking a city. In chapter 13, we as New Testament saints are seeking a city. Do you see that? And then in chapter 12, in the middle chapter there, we see that the heavenly Jerusalem is going to be an assembly of both. And so it's crystal clear. I, I don't know what else to say, but go back to Revelation 21, if you would, for even more proof that the Old Testament saints are part of this group of the saved that will make up the bride of Christ. The Bible says in uh, verse number 18, and the building of the wall of it was of jasper, and the city was pure gold like unto clear glass, and the foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third a chalcedony, the fourth an emerald, the fifth sardonyx. And so we see this list of precious stones, 12 precious stones. Now what's interesting about this is that there's a similar list of 12 precious stones in the book of Exodus, because if you remember, Aaron, the high priest, had these holy garments, and part of it was a golden breastplate that Aaron would wear. And this, is, I believe, is found in Exodus chapter 28. And Exodus 28 describes the, the holy breastplate that Aaron wore as being a golden breastplate inlaid with 12 stones. And what's interesting is that in those 12 stones were written the names of the 12 patriarchs, the 12 sons of Jacob, you know, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, etc., here, those stones are labeled with the 12 apostles of the Lamb. So in the Old Testament, on the priest's chest, the 12 gems were labeled with the 12 patriarchs. In the New Testament here, they're labeled with the 12 apostles, showing that the 12 apostles are basically the New Testament equivalent of the 12 patriarchs. You know, they're basically, uh, as a connection there that we see, okay? 
Now you say, well, the, the stones don't exactly match up, but actually the, the stones do match up. Now, some of them are given different names just because of the fact that the, the book of Exodus was written thousands of years earlier in a different language, in Hebrew. And then, of course, the New Testament's written in Greek, and so different languages word things differently, and the names for stones change over time. I mean, people today, even scholars, look back at Exodus 28, and, the, you know, they can't quite figure out exactly what gems those are referring to. Just because it was so long ago, it's hard for them always to understand exactly which gem is being referenced. But if you compare the list, which I've done, and, and you, you, you take the list of Exodus 28, and you take the list of Revelation 21, you'll see that seven of them match up exactly. You know, just word for word. You know, I, I don't have the list in front of me, but you know, the topaz matches up, the barrel, etc. There are seven of them that match up perfectly. Then there are five others that you're kind of left with on each side. But they actually match up. They're just different words for the same type of stone. For example, uh, one of the ones that's listed here, if you look down at your Bible there, is the sardonyx uh, in verse number 20. It says the fifth stone is the sardonyx, right? Well, in the Old Testament, it just calls it the onyx. Well, you can look at those two words and see, okay, this is the same stone. You know, one of them is onyx and one of them is sard onyx. It's the same thing. And then also you could, you could see, uh, if, you, if you study these stones, the agate is the chalcedony. The ligure from Exodus 28 is the jacinth of Revelation 21. And so on and so forth. You know, you can do some matching up and, and figure out which is which. So it's the same stone. So God here is tying in Old Testament symbolism and, and the Old Testament high priest there with the New Testament apostles of the Lamb. Jesus Christ, of course, was the high priest after the order of Melchizedek. And so this doctrine that states that the church is the bride of Christ and that church age saints are the ones that we're referring to, and, you know, and you say, well, what about when it says husbands loved your wives as Christ loved the church? But look, just because that's your logic. That's your interpretation. That's not what the Bible tells us is the bride of Christ. Just because you look at a parable where God's comparing Christ's love for the church of a husband loving his wife doesn't mean that you can now just define the bride of Christ as only church age saints. When here we have 12 Old Testament people mentioned, we have all the evidence from the book of Hebrews, and we have the evidence from Ephesians chapter 2. It's just not a biblical doctrine. But you get people who, who take this and they run with it, and they get so extreme with it, that they start saying it's only Baptists after a while, you know, or it's only people who go to a certain type of Baptist church. You know, it has to be an independent Baptist. Look, I'm all for going to an independent Baptist church. You know, you say, well, what would, what would you be if you weren't Baptist? Ashamed of myself, you know, right? I mean, I'm a Baptist. I'm not saying I'm going to go to some kind of a, a, another type of non-denom John type church. But I am saying that if you believe on Christ, you're saved even if you never set foot in a church in your whole life. And you're going to walk in the light of this city. You're going to be a part of the bride of Christ. I don't care who you are, when you lived, if you believe on Christ, you're part of it. And people will just extrapolate these parables out and just get, I mean, here's, here's the craziest one I ever heard. They said, well, you know, we know that the rapture is before the tribulation because Jesus is not a wife beater, is what they said. He's not going to beat up on the bride before the wedding day. And, you know, go ahead and pat yourself on the back, you know, Pastor Cutie Pie, for coming up with such a, a cute little uh, illustration of, Jesus ain't a wife beater, amen? You know, I'm sure you're going to get a lot of amens from the ignorant, but, but hold on a second. I thought Jesus beats us all. The Bible says, whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Now, isn't a scourge a beating? Somebody help me out. So if he says, whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. And then they're going to turn off. Well, we know that we're not going to go through the tribulation because Jesus isn't a white beater. First of all, are we even the bride of Christ yet? No. Number two, are we his sons? Yes. Does he beat his sons? Yes, he does. And not only that, but... Guess what? The tribulation is not God beating up on anybody. Because, now, again, they've made the mistake of confusing the tribulation with God's wrath. God will not pour out his wrath on his people. 
we have not been appointed to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. But the tribulation, of course, has nothing to do with God's wrath. But, but again, we see doctrine that's biblical on one hand, where we just go to the Bible and say, okay, let's study the bride of Christ in the Bible. We see who it is, the saved. That's what the Bible actually says, the saints. And then we have this doctrine that's just based on people taking parables. Well, you know, since we're supposed to love our wives like he loved the church, that must mean that the church is the only thing that's considered his wife. And, and just because John is the friend of the bridegroom, that means he's not part of the bride because he's an Old Testament, you know. And we just get all this man-made teaching and man-made, and we know it's pre-trib because, you know, Jesus isn't going to beat up on his wife before the wedding day. You know, he's not going to be a wife beater and all this nonsense. Instead, just reading Matthew 24, where he said it's after the tribulation, we're going to come up with just parables about beating your wife. I mean, that's what these guys come up with. That's all they got. So in uh, Revelation 21 here, let's continue. We see uh, some of the other differences here. The, the, the bulk of the chapter is just talking about the bride of Christ, the Lamb's wife, also known as the heavenly Jerusalem. Now, what's interesting is that and I already did this back in uh, chapter 17 when I preached on chapter 17. Remember when we compared the great whore with the bride of Christ and they matched up as opposites, you know, as contrary one to another? And remember how it used the same wording in chapter 17 where he said, come hither, I'll show thee the great whore. Here he said, come hither, I'll show thee the lamb's wife. And, and we already went through that in chapter 17. And we talked about the fact that chapter 21, the new Jerusalem... The bride of Christ represents a group of people, the saved, and how the great whore represented apostate Christianity, false religion. But also it's interesting because they both represent a city because Babylon is a city in chapter 17. In chapter 21, New Jerusalem is a city. Look what it says in verse number 22 of chapter 21. It says, And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it. For the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it, and the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. So here's another colossal difference between the new earth and the old earth. Besides the fact that there's no more sea, besides the fact that, that, that hell is no longer located in the center of the earth, also we see that there's no night there. I mean, just 24-7, the lights are on, you know, and it's bright and it's the, it's the lamb that lights it up. So it's not going to be heavenly bodies moving that cycle through day and night, you know, the sun, the moon. There's no need of the sun because the lamb is the light thereof. And so this is probably every child's favorite verse, no night there, because every child hates to go to bed at night, don't they? And when you're an adult, you want to go to bed, right? We look at this, we look at this verse as adults and get a little bit nervous. Like, no, what are you talking, no night there? What are you talking, I mean, I thought that, you know, I thought hell was no rest day or night, you know? Good night. But, you know, we just by faith just believe that I guess God's going to give us the energy and everything to stay awake all that time. But we as adults, we love to go to sleep. If someone forced us to take a nap, we'd love that, right? But kids, they hate taking a nap. They hate going to sleep. And, and how many times have we, I have seven children, and when we put our kids to bed, they'll, they'll cry and be so upset. And sometimes you'll ask them, you know, why are you crying? And they say like, what's that? And they say like, I didn't get to play enough today. And, you're like, and you try to tell them. Tomorrow morning, you're going to wake up. You can play again. Yeah. But I didn't get to play enough today. You know, you're playing all day. You know, you can play all day tomorrow. What are you talking about? You're homeschooled. No, I'm just kidding. But anyway, and, and uh, they hate going to bed. So kids, this, this one's for you. No night there. Never go to bed again. Never take a nap again, all right? Uh, we adults are not as jazzed about that verse as you are. But it says in verse 24, the nations of them which are saved. Now, notice the word nations. Do you see that? And then notice another word halfway through, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. So even after the millennium, even after we're done ruling and reigning with Christ for a thousand years, when we're in the eternal state here of just the new heaven, new earth, no sorrow, no pain, no death, there are still nations and there are still kings. Do you see that? So let me ask you this. Is this some kind of a communist utopia that we're going to live in for all eternity? 
See, the world often brainwashes us with this communist philosophy of, you know, in a perfect world, everybody's equal. In a perfect world, there's no such thing as the haves and the have-nots, and, and we all are the same, and we're all equal, and we all the, is that how it's going to be for all eternity? Are we all going to be equal? Somebody's going to be a king, and somebody's not. Somebody's going to be part of one nation, somebody's going to be part of another. And it's based upon your merits of how you live your life on this earth. The Bible's really clear about that. And you know, Revelation, it seems like, uh, more than other books of the Bible, really emphasizes the rewards. He talks about bringing the rewards. He talks about rewarding us according to our works. Now, the doctrine of Jesus Christ rewarding us according to our works is a very important doctrine. And I've heard a lot of people try to deny this doctrine. I've heard people say uh, that, no, no, we're all going to be equal. We're all going to get the same reward. And God's not a respecter of persons. This and that. Now, he's not a respecter of persons, but he is a respecter of work. And he says he'll reward us based on our work. And no, we will not all be equal. No, we will not all get the same reward. The Bible talks about, uh, in, for example, 2 John. He says, look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. Every man will receive a reward according as his work shall be. You say, why is that an important doctrine? Why does it matter? So what? When we get there, either we get a reward or we don't. So what? Here's why it matters, because salvation's free. Salvation is free. And because salvation is free, if we turn around and do works, because look, we're saved. Pretty much, I, I, I'm assuming probably everybody here is saved tonight, or the, at least the vast majority. You know, there could be Judas Iscariot amongst you, you know. But the vast majority of people that are in church on an off night like this are obviously saved, the majority. Okay. We're saved. And the fact that you're here, you're probably one that does some work for God. You're doing some good works in your life. Okay, well, God wants to make sure that we know that those good works are not somehow paying for our salvation. Because salvation is not of works, lest any man should boast. You see, if it were of works, we could boast, right? Now, there are a lot of people that teach, well, you don't have to do any works to get saved, but then they turn around and teach that you have to do works to stay saved. Or they'll say you have to do works to prove that you're saved, you know, and, and that if you don't do the works, you're not saved. Of course, Romans 4 shoots that out of the water. The whole chapter of Romans 4 is a great chapter on that. But I love this doctrine of rewards because it so vividly illustrates how free salvation is. Because you know what God's saying with rewards? Here's what he's saying. Salvation is so free and it's completely paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ and just to demonstrate that to you, any work that you do is not going to be applied toward paying me back for what I did for you. No, no, no. I'll, I'll reward you for the works that you do just so that we know that's a separate transaction. I think, that's what it, I think that's what we see from the doctrine of rewards. Because what it shows is that when it comes to salvation, it's paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ and nothing else. So then when we work for God... He doesn't just say, well, I'm not going to pay you for the work you did because look what I did for you over here. Because no, 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 that was a gift. Yeah. That's separate. I mean, think about this. What if I gave Scott, what if I gave him a big gift? What if I gave him, you know, a, a new vehicle, right? And let's say that vehicle was worth $10,000. And I, I said, here you go, Scott. I'm giving you a new vehicle for a gift. It's a $10,000 gift, right? And then what if a few weeks later I commanded Scott not asked him to, but I commanded Scott, Scott, you need to mow my lawn, right? And then Scott came over and mowed my lawn, and I said, I'm not going to pay you for that, Scott, because I gave you that $10,000 car. Was that $10,000 car a gift? Even if he paid after the fact with his work and his labor by mowing that lawn, He's still paying me something for that, and that doesn't make it a gift. So think about, isn't that similar to what's going on with God? You know, God gave us this big gift, right? And then he commands us to work for him. Is he commanding us to work for him because we owe him that because of what he did for us? No, because he promises that if we work for him, he'll pay us. He said, knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. God promises us that any time we work for him, he will pay us. 
he will reward us. And I believe personally that the reason why he emphasizes the reward so much is just to let us know that gift was free, period. The gift was free. And you say, well, we're bought with a price. We owe him that. Yes, we are bought with a price. Yes, we do owe him that, but we could never pay it back. And that's why he pays us when we work. And every bit of work that we do, we will be paid for it. And we will be rewarded. And if you think the Apostle Paul and the thief on the cross are going to get the same reward, you're wrong. They're going to get different rewards. And here we see that there are going to be people that are kings and people that are not. There are also going to be nations. You know, people think nations are bad. We need to just all join together and hold hands and, and, and join forces and not have these distinctions of nation. And look, I'm not, I'm not, look, we're not talking about race here, by the way. Don't get me wrong. The Bible never uses the word race except when it talks about running a race. Nations are, are basically uh, groups of people not necessarily determined by skin color, okay? Because there are all kinds of nations where the people's skins are the exact same color, but they're still different nations. It's just different families. It's just different groups. It's different tribes of the earth. And, and there will still be nations someday in the new heaven and the new earth. There will still be nations. And there will still be kings. And there will still be a distinction between those who have great rewards and those who have small rewards. And the Bible says in verse 26, and they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it, and there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. Boy, isn't this going to be great someday? What a place. No sorrow, no sadness, no crying, no death, and just... There's nothing to mess it up. That's what defileth means. Nothing to mess up. Uh, God's perfect paradise here. No devil, no, no abominable workers of iniquity, but just righteousness and godliness and joy and peace and happiness. And, and you know, we're going to be working for God all throughout eternity. And it's, it's going to be great. It's something to look forward to. And, you know, we got to keep our eyes on this finish line and set our affection on the things above, not on the things on the earth. Not laying up for ourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal, but we're laying up for ourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where our treasure is, there will our heart be also. And, and here we see the city that Abraham had his mind set on. He looked for a city which hath foundations whose builder and maker is God. All of those died in faith Looking forward to being in this city. I hope that you're looking forward to being in that city someday as well. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for your word and, and for the clear teaching of your word. Please help us not to be deceived by the cunning craftiness and slight of men who uh, teach a lot of false doctrine for various reasons. Help us to study to show ourselves approved. Help us to read your word and, and see what it actually says, not to just uh, take parables and man's logic and man's interpretation, but rather just read the text for what it says and who it says is going to be there. And, and Lord, we thank you so much for uh, the chance to look within your word, help us to understand it, guide us and direct us into all truth. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen.